Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us um, for today's webinar titled How Community Composters Navigate Hauling Permits, Examples and Model Policies. Uh, my name is Courtney Brown. I am the founder and director of Common Compost, located in Oakland, California. And I also work um, as the project director for the California Alliance for Community Composting and as a consultant for the Sustainable Economies Law Center. Um, we are here uh, in partnership with the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. Um, as uh, uh, one webinar in their series on a distributed and diversified compost industry. Um, we will uh, be joined also today by Janelle Orsi, um, the director of the Sustainable Economies Law Center, who will give us a little bit of a legal background to the process of hauling permits for small scale operators. And this is um, also uh, with the assistance today from Virginia Streeter of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. Um, we will have uh, three speakers be joining us. Uh, the first to speak today will be David Paul. He is the co-founder and chief impact officer at Compost Now, based out of North Carolina. Um, Compost Now is a subscription-based compost collection service focused on diverting food waste from landfills and building healthy soils. David founded, uh, also founded Compost Wheels in Atlanta, Georgia in 2012, which later merged with the North Carolina-based Compost Now in 2017. But he will be speaking today about his experience with Compost Wheels in the permit process in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, Compost Now um, employs over 50 full-time soil slingers, root wranglers, and dirt dorks who collectively work to empower communities to become compostable. He's a Wisconsin native, and David is passionate about good food, the environment, society's role in designing resilient and regenerative communities. We'll also be joined today by Kristen Baskin. She is the founder of Let Us Compost in Athens, Georgia, and the mother of three muddy daughters. She has been driving change in Georgia composting industry since 2012. And then we'll also be joined today by Molly Lindsay. Um, <clears throat> she is the uh, project director of um, the uh, community composting in uh, Oh, I just lost my place on the page. Um, of a Hudson Soil Company and Community Composting Company. They uh, do small scale hauling um, in uh, lower New York, Manhattan area, and also in New Jersey. Um, they are based out of the Hudson Valley. They were founded in 2014, and they are food scrap collection to residents, businesses, and institutions. They um, also sell their finished compost. Um, so we'd also like to just uh, pull our audience uh, quickly before we get started today to figure out a little bit more about you guys and who's on the call and um, what we can focus on uh, here today during our webinar. So the first question is, are you currently hauling? Please take a moment. There's a poll in progress for attendees and you can choose yes, no, or no, but interested in starting. All right, we've got the results in. 75% of today's uh, per, uh, attendees are in the business of hauling. 13% are no, and 13% are no, but interested in starting. So that is great. Um, our second polling question today uh, is, have, uh, do you have a permit or other official permission for hauling? Select one of the following answers, yes or no. Wait for a few more answers to come in. And the result is 100% of the people on the call today do not have a permit or other official permission for hauling. Um, so this is a really interested, interesting dichotomy, and I hope that we will be able to get into that 
and also provide uh, the listeners today with a little bit of information about what that process looks like and what you can do to change the situation. Um, so I'd like to uh, take a moment right now to turn the attention over to Janelle Orsi, the project director of the Sustainable Economies Law Center. And she'll just give us a little bit of a legal overview of what uh, the permitting or the contract process for hauling organic materials looks like. So thank you for joining us today, Janelle. Um, turn it over to you. Looks like you're muted, Janelle. I'm not sure anybody can actually hear you yet. There we go. Okay, you can hear me, right? Yes, thank you so much. Oh, okay, <laughs> good. <laughs> All right, hey everybody. So, um, so I, uh, I think the most interesting part of this webinar is gonna just be hearing from different composters and about how you're going about doing hauling and if or how you've tried to get official permission if official permission is needed from your city it's kind of fascinating to see the variation across geography and uh, we're in california oakland california where i want to say cities have done a lot more to regulate hauling uh, perhaps in comparison to other parts of the country but we'll find out i mean everybody i think i'm hoping everyone here will share their experience and we can learn from each other but I'll just share what feels to me like just what we've observed so far as trends and what we've been thinking about as far as best practices and just to to clarify we're really just talking about collection and hauling here and the laws regarding that and the permissions needed we're not talking about how do you get your actual compost site permitted we're not talking about how do you sell compost because other areas of law do come up um, so we're just narrowly focusing on this part um, and to me at least so far what we've observed in California is this is the biggest hurdle um, which is why we want to do the webinar on it now and um, whereas other aspects of composting and compost enterprise tend to basically have laws that are a little bit more navigable hauling can sometimes create insurmountable barriers so, um, um, and, and speaking of the word hauling, I was a little bit conflicted about even using the word hauling because when I say haul, I picture a big truck. It just sounds like something large that you're doing. And I think a lot of people, perhaps on this call, are transporting and moving around small buckets of things or five gallon buckets of things, things that you don't quite picture when you say the word haul. So I'd be interested to hear what words you all use. Are you saying haul or collect or um, for the purpose of engaging with lawmakers, regulators, sometimes using different words can provoke different reactions. And so instead of using the word haul, lately I've been using transport because it's just moving things around um, and hopefully not trying to like, trigger a vision that we're giant trucks hauling things around. But anyways, that's just a preliminary thought. But in general, um, Courtney, you've been editing my slides today. <laughs> I'm like, hmm. Um, thanks for the input. Uh, let me just make sense of this for a second. Anyways, but yeah, so the point is like, so if you're hauling, if you're in a city that actually has regulations about this, um, this is in general what you would find um, is you might need a permit or a license to do the hauling. And sometimes you'll find this out just by going and getting your business license. You'll say, okay, I'm in business. Here's the name of my compost business. Um, and usually they wanna make sure that you have whatever permissions needed to operate in the city. Um, so that's one way you might find out about it. Um, but there are, I think there are cities where um, there's just no regulation of this or no requirement to get a permit. Um, and my sense is that will change. And one of the reasons it'll change is what we're seeing here in California is there are statewide mandates to start recycling organics everywhere. A lot of this is driven by um, wanting to reduce the size of landfills, but really to reduce methane emissions that come from landfills and that come from organic material being in the landfills. So the state of California is saying, every city needs to compost everything 
more or less, or divert organics from landfills, I should say. Uh, doesn't necessarily mean composted, but um, and cities in response are then creating systems and rules for how this is going to happen. So if there aren't requirements now to get a permit, chances are in the future there will be. Um, so yeah, you might need the permit. There also might be a competitive bidding process to get an exclusive contract. So cities are often doing this thing where a certain part of the city or all of the city is going to be, uh, waste is going to be removed by just one party and then you have to actually bid to be that be that enterprise that does the, the hauling. Um, and yeah, as Courtney added here, you might need to have a business license and put up a bond, but I'll talk more about that. Um, there are in some cities rules about the collection containers. What do they look like? How are they sealed? Um, are they shielded from the street um, or shielded from view? And how often are they put out? The vehicle you use might also need a special permit or approval uh, and inspection. And, and then my last point here is you might wish you hadn't asked. And yeah, the reality is every now and then I hear about composters who are doing amazing stuff. It's like, yeah, you're collecting from 500 different households and creating really rich soil. That's amazing. How did you get approval to do that? And they're like, we haven't really talked to the city. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm not your lawyer, so I'm not going to worry about that on your behalf. Um, and I think the reality is a lot of people just haven't asked their city if there's a process and they're going about and doing their wonderful things. And um, so I just wanted to, you know, acknowledge that, um, that that's happening. And um, yeah, <laughs> so anyway, it's onwards. Biggest barriers. These are, if, like the two biggest barriers are, one is you might be in a city where you just plain cannot get a permit to haul. And this is, I want to say this is not common, but our fear is that it'll become more common. This is the reality in our city of Oakland, which is there are one or two big companies that have permits to do the hauling and nobody else is allowed to, with a few uh, very narrow exceptions. And so if somebody wanted to get a permit, went to the city and said, hey, I'm going to collect from these houses, chances are they just plain could not get a permit. And then the big corporation with the biggest contract in Oakland negotiated for this exclusive right to haul and then the city in turn um, amended our local ordinance to say that that hauler waste management has uh, the exclusive right to haul. So that could be a problem but hopefully it's not a problem and we want to also prevent it become, from becoming more widespread. Uh, but more likely if your city does require a permit the biggest problem might just be that there are costly requirements or challenging hurdles. You might need to pay a fee to get the permit. Uh, you might need a bond or special insurance, not just for your business, but also for your vehicle. There might be a long application you have to fill out. You might need special equipment. Um, if they want to inspect your vehicles, there's usually fees for inspecting the vehicles. Um, sometimes there's even a requirement to publish public notice or have a hearing. So it could feel a little bit much, especially in relation to um, just hauling on a very small scale. Um, specifically with regard to vehicles, of course, I think the main intention is to make sure that they're not going to be dumping things around town, um, that they're cleaned often enough and they're not smelling bad, that they're not just sitting parked on the street full of stuff. Um, None of this is very hard. What's hard is when the city needs to inspect the vehicle in order to verify that this stuff is happening. And then there's that inspection fee. Uh, but I have seen some weird requirements, for example, that you own the vehicle, um, which is annoying. Let's say if you just need to rent a truck once a week or just borrow somebody's truck um, or have employees use their own vehicles. So that could be an annoying requirement you run into. And, and then there's insurance. Sometimes a city will say you need to have a million dollars in liability coverage instead of uh, what tends to be more common for most individual vehicles, which is like 100 to 300,000. So um, that's some of the stuff that comes up around vehicles. Um, 
And if you want to research your local laws, I really encourage you to do this. It's very empowering to go to your municipal code and start clicking around. It's also fun because invariably you find funny things in the law, like old archaic laws, um, laws about things you never would have thought they make laws about. So, and it's just good to become comfortable navigating your own local municipal code. Most of these things are online now, and that makes it easy to go on there and do word searches. This is usually how I do it. I just go put in words like haul, collect, waste, rubbish, until, until you find the area of code that feels like it's relevant. And sometimes it's a multiple areas of code, but um, that's basically how I go about doing it. And then cities, if they're good, have also created more user-friendly information on their websites, like about how to obtain a permit, and they put the applications on there. Uh, and then when all else fails, you can call and ask, um, hey, I want to do some collection of organics. Here's what I'm planning. What do I need to do? Just ask. Um, and of course, you could, you, we've tried to do this where we call cities where we're not actually doing any composting ourselves, but we want to see what their reaction is. I mean, asking for a friend or just in general trying to collect information. Sometimes it's hard to get an answer. And one reason it's hard is a lot of people in the city just don't have answers. They're not used to getting asked these questions. So you're more likely to get an answer if you're really going to do it. And that basically forces the city to say, OK, here's the process. And then which department do you talk to? It, every city has different names for different departments, but it might be public works, the health department, business licensing, planning department. You have to kind of poke around and figure out who's the relevant department. Um, but here are just some tips and some experiences for how to navigate the law and, and also change the law. Because like I said, chances are, if the laws haven't been written yet, they're being written now or they're going to be written soon. And that is because organics recycling is becoming so much more widespread. And it's so important that community composters make their voices heard in this process or even be really proactive in initiating some of some lawmaking. And there are different levels and ways to do it. Um, usually if cities are going to be seeking bids, they have to, at least in some states, um, they have to actually get feedback on what their bid seeking process is going to be. So you can give feedback when that's happening. When they're entering into contracts with haulers, you can sometimes give feedback on that process or show up at city council meetings and give feedback on the contract. That tends to be a little bit less, I guess, um, visible to the public, but you can ask to be involved and give um, feedback. And then just the drafting of local ordinances, regulations, legislation. Legislation versus regulation, the difference is like, legislators as in elected legislators lawmakers write laws but then they tell agencies specialized agencies to then craft regulations um, and when you're giving you can give input in either of these processes and we've been actually doing in California a lot of work at the level of regulations because our state agency Cal Recycle is drafting up a lot of the rules right now about how cities should do organics recycling um, but yeah, lots of composters in, in California have been showing up to hearings or writing letters and giving inputs. So that's been exciting. And I encourage everybody to do it. Uh, and in doing all of this, of course, it's always really neat. It's really necessary to keep in mind the purposes of the laws. And you know, a lot of this is obvious, but if you're gonna be asking um, your local city or your state to craft laws. It's just good to keep in mind well, what is it that they are trying to achieve? What are some of the worries that are going to come up for them around aesthetics or air quality and that kind of thing? Uh, so here's one approach that we've taken, and this is in Oakland where, of course, the law is a little bit extreme, um, which is we've been arguing that. Organic material, if the intention for it is to compost it and create good soil uh, with it, it never becomes waste. It's never entering the waste waste stream. So any laws that are relevant to waste shouldn't be applicable. And this is, we're actually going to send a letter to our city and get their feedback on this. But for example, Oakland law says it's unlawful for anyone to collect or haul organic materials. And there's a few exceptions, which we often don't meet but um but then if you look at the definition of collect it's refers to collect 
collecting discarded material. And then discarded material makes a circular reference back to stuff that's put out for collection. So in the end, we realize, well, we really need to be interpreting this word discarded in the way that most people use it, which is that it's something that you don't want anymore, it's useless or it's undesirable. Because if you don't interpret the word discard or waste in that way, then any piece of organic material that is moving around in the city could be subject to this law. It would be overly broad to say that it's unlawful for people to collect or haul organic materials. And I, I was thinking about pizza delivery, you know, a do food delivery person will go and collect a pizza and then deliver it to a home. You could argue that they're violating this law around collecting and hauling organic materials if you were applying a really broad definition um, or a broad interpretation of this law. Um, but obviously the city's not cracking down on pizza delivery because pizza's not discarded. It's something of value. And the more that people are getting enthusiastic about composting, about building healthy soil, like people really value this organic matter. Like I've heard people talk about manure with just passion for how much richness it adds to the soil. Like it is truly valuable. Um, and our cities don't necessarily see it that way, but composters and the people who are providing the organic material do see it that way and so it's never discarded it's never useless and so this is this is kind of the approach we're taking in Oakland um, and we also also add that I think whether or not money changes hands should be irrelevant because there's there's also generally an assumption that if someone's paying you to take their organic material away then it must be waste because they don't want it they're, they they're so so much intent on giving it away that they will pay you to come take it away. Um, so people have said, well, that just proves that it's waste, that it's discarded and useless. But you know, if you're if you're going to pay someone to babysit your children, it's not because you consider your children useless or unwanted. It's actually because you value them a lot and you want them to be you know taken good care of. And so if you're paying a composter to come take your organic material and turn it into good soil, it's because you value it so much that you want to make sure that it's going back to the earth in a healthy way. So that's my long-winded way of saying like we as a compost movement need to be need to sort of hone our arguments around waste and what waste is and perhaps move ourselves outside of that that whole concept altogether but, but nevertheless when you can't move yourself outside of the typical realms of waste regulation then you can either find or ask for exemptions um, ask for as in like lobby for them or sometimes there's discretion um, to be applied but uh, so like if you go to your code, you'll see something that says, okay, you need a permit if you're gonna be doing hauling, but here are all the exceptions. And there's usually a list of exceptions or exemptions. Um, sometimes you'll see if you are just hauling something that you personally generated, like you, your own banana peel, you can potentially have some latitude to decide where you're gonna go and dispose of that or where you're gonna take it. Um, that's a little bit of a different concept from having a self hauling permit um, where self-hauling permits are often they're especially for people like um, let's say a um, like an apartment building owner that wants to do the waste removal for the entire complex might seek a self-hauling permit um, but I do feel like I, I've heard of composters with I think creative workarounds or who are kind of using this exception for example, by having people take their organic scraps to a farmer's market and collecting them in a central location there. Um, so that composter is not doing any hauling. Everyone who generates their own organic matters is, is doing their own hauling. Uh, we've seen ex exceptions or exemptions when you donate organic material to a nonprofit. Uh, but we've been arguing in California for something a little bit broader than that, which is not just to restrict it to donation, but to but to include if if it's being purchased or if you're paying a composter to take it away. Um, and that well, we've also been using the phrase community benefit composting, which is generally you know composting for environmental, charitable, educational purposes by a nonprofit. Um, so a little bit broader than just donating it to a nonprofit. 
Um, we've also been arguing for exemptions for transporting material to micro composting sites and we've been using 20 cubic yards or 200 square feet for that, that definition or arguing for exceptions, exemptions for transporting material to composting sites where like let's say it's a farm composting everything on site and then applying the compost on site but it needs a little bit of extra organic material to have really rich and balanced compost so allowing for transport in that that case so we've been arguing for these exemptions haven't been that successful yet in in gaining them but these are just examples of what you could also argue for if needed and then if there aren't ex exemptions you can just argue that certain requirements of the law should be more reasonably reasonably tailored to the size of what you're doing so if you're a very small scale hauler doing small scale composting you can't afford to do a lot of things that large scale haulers do and so paying for inspection fees might be out of your range for example so you could argue that certain small scale haulers should just have a self inspection checklist for their vehicles or that the insurance the liability limit should be lower to reduce costs or just that the fees for getting a permit should be lower or there should be a more streamlined process that kind of thing um, and at, at the california level i just i'll just show the example like we've been doing doing some advocacy at the state level and of course many of these things are regulated at the city level when it comes to hauling it tends to be very very much regulated at the city level not state um, but we've been asking the state to be a little bit more heavy handed to make sure that cities aren't creating unreasonable barriers. And so we just requested our state agency create a regulation that says that local jurisdictions should not create unreasonable barriers to transporting materials to micro composting sites, the, that 20 cubic yard um, level site, the community benefit composting sites, the ones managed by nonprofits or that supplemented on site composting. So that's what we've requested. So we'll see how that comes out in the regulations that are being written now. Um, and lastly, I just want to suggest that composters can, community scale composters could be thinking a lot more in advance. Like if you know your city's going to start to seek bids for this kind of thing, for organic um, recycling, uh, or if there's currently a contract in place that's going to be re renegotiated after a period of years, you could start to plan, get a lot of stakeholder input, maybe stake out an area of the city that you feel like is reasonably doable for your organization and gear up to make a bid. But of course, that takes a lot of planning. Um, but I, I think more of us should be trying that and envisioning what would it take to do that. Um, so that's just like my overview, um, trying to set the stage, but now I think I'm just really interested to hear about what people have encountered in their own communities and how they're doing hauling. So I'll pass it back to, um, I guess, Courtney to then um, call our speakers and our panelists. Thank you so much, Janelle. That was very informative. I know that we've been working on this together a lot and that the Sustainable Economies Law Center started a program on compost specifically because a lot of people are coming to them with these exact questions. I want to start a community compost project in my neighborhood. What do I need to know about the law? Um, turns out if we just focus on one section of the law, which is moving the material around your community, that can get massively complicated quite quick. So um, I appreciate you adding that context um, for framing this discussion today. Uh, next, we will be joined by David Paul from Compost Now, um, speaking about his experience with compost wheels in Atlanta, Georgia. David Paul, turning it over to you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Courtney. Thanks everyone for being on with us today. So I am going to talk about uh, some of our experiences in Georgia, uh, though I do have context for more than more than that at this point with Compost Now's work extending really to the the southeast, uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. So my large portion of my experience has been in Georgia with uh, the founding of Compost Wheels, and then as Courtney mentioned in the introduction, 
the merging of Compost Wheels with Compost Now uh, in late 2017. So, uh, let's see here. Just a quick overview of who we are. Uh, we've been doing this since uh, 2011 as Compost Now, since 2012 as Compost Wheels, and collectively uh, been working to divert food waste from landfills and build healthy soil in our communities. That has looked uh, pretty much the same in most of the communities that we work with. Um, one of the key differences with Atlanta is that there's very little processing infrastructure surrounding Atlanta, if any. Uh, so that has kind of necessitated a, a focus on policy and a number of initiatives to work on uh, shifting rules and regulations to be supportive uh, and not hinder the, the growth and development of this movement. So that's, that's something that I have a lot of familiarity with that I'll, I'll touch on today. As mentioned before, uh, we are now operating in the markets that are listed here. Uh, and have been expanding our efforts um, pretty quickly over the past couple of years uh, geographically. And the connection in the Southeast is uh, one that makes a lot of sense. We're able to uh, quickly move between the, the various markets and work together on progressing forward composting in, um, in a way that is, I think, uh, more impactful together than apart. In the time that we've been doing this, we have uh, been able to divert over 9.5 million pounds uh, from the landfill and uh, convert that into finished compost with either uh, our composting partners, which can range from, uh, in the beginning, small farms and gardens to, at this point, large-scale uh, compost manufacturers, as well as our own compost manufacturing site here in uh, the Atlanta area. So we're feeling good about these numbers. Obviously, it's a small dent in an extremely large problem that we're continuing to work really hard on uh, solving. How we do this, uh, so we primarily use Sprinter vans for our hauling uh, of residential, and these, these vans have uh, proven to be great. Um, they're lightweight, they're easy to maneuver. We're able to hire a wide range of folks to do this work um, and drive these vehicles. They don't require any special um, driving licenses. And then we have our larger box trucks, as you can see in the back there, for um, our cart swaps for commercial. And that is a method that has also been uh, great for um, just ease of maneuverability within the cities, the dense areas that we operate in. Um, and then within the past year, we've just gotten into kind of like the garbage uh, truck scale with some of the larger commercial um, work that we're doing in the Triangle and in Charleston market. So these, these methods of transportation we found to be most effective, most efficient um, uh, maintenance on these diesel vehicles. Uh, we I went with Mercedes vans just because of the quality of, of the build of these vehicles over something like a Transit uh, or a ProMaster from Dodge and Ford. So here in Atlanta and actually just company wide, we do have hauling permits um, and you know really low cost to get them. Um, North Carolina, it's pretty well established, so it's it's something that's um, you know easy to get. We have a hauling. Uh, permit by rule in Georgia. Again, very inexpensive. Didn't take a lot of time to file that paperwork. Um, send it into the Environmental Protection Department. Doesn't take a lot of time. Um, and then on sort of more significantly that I can discuss um, that I think is relevant to, to hauling permits in the discussion here is just that um, we had to push forward a process of getting a rule changed in the state of Georgia in, in relation to solid waste handling uh, permit for processing the material. And I'm going to talk mostly not about what we do with the processing, but of the process of getting that, um, that rule changed. And this was successfully done because a group of stakeholders came together uh, over the course of identifying this this massive gap of uh, infrastructure in the Atlanta area 
and said, we need to come together and work on this if we're going to move this, this movement forward. So folks like the Georgia Environmental Protection Department came to the, the table, uh, the EPA, uh, we had Foodwell Alliance, and for those that don't know who, who Foodwell Alliance is, they're a local organization in the Atlanta market that works to progress forward um, local food systems, and they do that through grant-making, uh, capacity building, and different leadership uh, efforts. We also have the Georgia Recycling Coalition, who's been doing work in this area for a long time, um, led by a woman named Gloria Hardegree, and then the Atlanta Mayor's Office of Resilience, who has become increasingly involved in the local food movement here in Atlanta with uh, actually a director of urban agriculture and urban ag ordinance that happened several years ago and uh, now a, a special interest in uh, organics diversion. So working with these folks, we all came to the table, looked at the current, what was the current uh, writing of the rule for processing uh, written uh, again in the, the solid waste handling uh, classifications for the for the uh, the Georgia EPD, and there's obvious obviously a gap for how it was written in um, how it could support small scale composters, uh, meaning there was a, a certain verbiage in there that really pigeonholed the work to uh, a rule that supported uh, within the permit by rule language supported manufacturers or, or farmers that would be composting most of what was produced on site and not bringing material from off site. So it was this strange proportion kind of rule that limited, significantly limited what was actually okay to bring to one of these sites, these on farm type composting sites uh, based off of what was generated on site in proportion to that off site material. So we changed that to, again, kind of what Janelle, you had mentioned in your time or your your focusing on uh, matching this to the scale at which we are working, uh, and I think that's important to note is we made the effort to uh, focus this on a tonnage limit so that it would still fit within this this uh, criteria and uh, motivation and mission for the EPD of protecting our natural resources and our communities that surround those uh, by limiting the tonnage that could be processed uh, under a, a permit by rule. And that was, uh, that took about two years to actually go through this, putting the stakeholders together, rewriting the, the rules, um, and then proposing that to the uh, Environmental Protection Board, uh, getting that to actually pass through, going to public hearings and things like that. So it definitely took a lot of investment, but I think the main conclusion for me in this and that I would like to pass on to through this is that this sort of effort I think is absolutely necessary. I think community composters have to be at the table for these conversations because we are on the ground doing the work and yes, oftentimes we are are jumping to action and and do and just taking uh, the opportunity at hand uh, to do something that we believe is important and is is to the benefit of all. So I think if we're not at the table, these rules will be put in place with less uh, connection to actually what's happening on the ground, which could be detrimental for all of us. So I highly encourage uh, everyone to get involved with their policymakers, uh, get involved with um, the different stakeholders that can come to the table that not only represent a private entity's interests, but represent more than that um, and tying this, continuing to tie this to the development of quality soil in our communities. I think if we do that well, um, we are going to see a lot of, of great policy changes. Uh, to learn more about that policy specifically, um, ILSR did put out a, a best management practices guide and had a certain section of that that was specific to Georgia's uh, rules. So you can find out more there. Um, also, feel free to reach out to me at david at compostnow.org, and I will wrap it up from there. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. That was very informative um, about the process in Atlanta, Georgia. 
Um, now I would like to turn it over to Kristen Baskin, who is a close neighbor, and she will be talking about the process in Athens, Georgia. Kristen? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, you sound great. Okay, awesome. Um, the permitting process was very fun. Uh, so what happened is when I knew that Athens needed this service. Um, so the first thing I did was just call our solid waste department. And I asked her if there was a current hauling service and she said no. And then she told me this is the first year of our Georgia master composter class. Um, so I took that and then just investigated, you know, what facilities were open in the area and, you know, what was, what kind of permits were in existence. And so the second call I made um, was to the Georgia EPD and just said, hey, I'm Kristen, you know, I'd like to start this business. What, you know, what do I need to do to, to get started? And basically they didn't, uh, at the time they didn't, all, all they had was a permit by rule. Um, so she, she basically said, we love what you're doing. Here's a permit by rule. It's a really long document. Just don't uh, do anything wrong. Like don't do anything that's listed on this document and then you'll be fine. So it's been great. And the EPD has been very supportive. Um, it's been really fun to go to a couple of those meetings that, um, that David talked about. And that's basically how we navigated it. So it was something that was new and they didn't exactly have the rules, but they were supportive of us and they figured out ways to, um, to let us operate. And we didn't have a specific compost hauling permit in Athens at the time. There were a bunch of farmers who were just picking up buckets of compost. Um, they were people that were just doing it for free and they were honestly doing it kind of badly. Um, so for a while, uh, it took us a little bit of time to get, get people to kind of forget <laughs> about those free composters and to explain we're a paid service. Our service is awesome. You're going to be really happy with it. And the solid waste director was just super supportive. And it was a similar situation where it was so new that they didn't have rules to regulate it. Um, and there was already a limit on the number of solid waste haulers. So we couldn't become a trash hauler, but we could become a food waste hauler. Um, so we basically just developed a really good relationship with the composting facility and we when we first started, they were just composting biosolids and leaf and limb. And we had to take our compost first to Dragonfly Farm. And then we took it to a place called Wilbros that was a, the only commercial composting facility at the time. So we drove about an hour and a half to get there. And as we were driving, we were just pushing our solid waste department to let us do a pilot for a food scraps. So they finally did. And it was the most exciting day because we went from hauling an hour and a half to go to an EPD certified facility um, to just driving 10 minutes down the road. So we have a, an incredible EPD certified composting facility right in Athens. Um, it's pretty rad. There's only 100,000 people that live here. So it's a really small community, but we've got this world-class facility and it's being underutilized. So it could definitely be used more. Um, so that was the first step is getting them to accept food scraps into their facility. At first it was a pilot and then about a year later we actually got charged for it. So when we got charged for it, that was actually a sign that it was not exactly in the policy form yet, but it was getting close. So now, you know, food scraps are accepted. There's two types of compost that exist. There's food scrap compost and there's biosolid compost. Um, and the next step after that was we realized that um, there were a couple clients in Atlanta that wanted us to service them. One was the world of Coca-Cola and they wanted us to take their compostable cups. And so I, you know, pushed the composting facility to also accept compostable wares because I realized that if we were going to stay in business, we needed to be able to deal with larger clients. And a lot of them had these compostable wares and they also had meat. Um, so a lot of the policy changes came from, you know, very specific demands that our customers wanted and um, we wanted to both create a good product and also, you know, make sure that we attended to the needs of our clients. Um, so we then, you know, pushed them to open up the facility to Atlanta, um, which was awesome. 
um, so we were able to collect from World of Coca-Cola in what was then Phillips Arena, it's now Atlanta Hawks. And it's been really great. So we haven't actually gone through the process of getting bills passed, which I would love to get into this year and just do a little more research about that. Um, so far, it's just been kind of negotiations, really strong relationships and, um, you know, having enough documentation that exists. And if it doesn't exist, you know, getting as much as we can. Um, so, yeah, I'm a huge advocate of immediately working with the local government. You know, I'm a big believer that government is there to support um, support small business and support the needs of people. And if we ask them for what we need, they in the right way, in the nice way, in the fun way, they usually do it. And if we don't ask for what they need, what we need, then there's no opportunity. So, um, yeah, I'm just excited to continue to learn more and um, just push the industry forward in whatever way that makes operating um, as a hauler and as a, you know, deliver finished compost easier. That's it. Thank you, Kristen. I think the most interesting part of your story uh, was that a lot of the um, changes in policy were being directed by the client needs. Uh, so that's really the um, horse before the cart, literally. So that's very exciting to hear. Um, Next up, we've got Molly Lindsay from the Community Composting Company and Hudson Soil Company, who will discuss her process with permitting in New York and New Jersey. Molly, over to you. Thank you so much. Let me just get my presentation on full screen. Awesome. Um, I'm the Director of Operations at the Community Compost Company and Hudson Soil Company. Um, we're based in the Mid-Hudson Valley region, about 90 miles north of New York City, and we also service Hoboken and Jersey City in New Jersey. Um, we have a composting facility on a farm, and we also sell our finished compost through our brand, Hudson Soil Company. Um, in New Jersey, we're using a pickup truck with a lift gate to do our residential and commercial collection. Um, in New York, we do much more commercial collection. So we recently bought a five cubic yard dump truck that has two toter tippers, and it also has a power washer um, to clean out the bins. And um, in New York for our residential collection, uh, we use a small transit van. Um, you can see our service areas here. So we're operating in a few different counties in New York and then also in New Jersey. So we're headquartered in Ulster County um, and all of our trucks are registered in New York. Um, up until last year, we had only been using um, smaller vehicles like the pickup truck and we were hauling only about 2000 pounds per load. Um, but since the start of the business, we had to get a permit from the Ulster County Health Department. Um, so that was to transport offensive materials, solid waste, and regulated recyclable material. Um, and for that, we have to apply yearly and pay a $150 fee plus $30 per additional vehicle. Um, and we have that for all of the trucks in Ulster County. Um, and then with the addition of our dump truck that we got last year, we're hauling a much larger amount. So uh, it's about 5,000 pounds at maximum capacity. Um, and for that, we have to get a registration with the Department of Environmental Conservation um, for transporting solid waste. And we also had to apply for a DOT number um, both of those were free and it's very easy applications. It didn't take too much time. Um, and then in New Jersey, at this point, I recently called the Department of Environmental Protection and there's no permits required for transporting um, compostable materials since they are going to compost and they're not considered waste. They did tell me that this might change in the near future, so to continue checking back with them. Um, but really, we really didn't have that many barriers in terms of getting these permits needed for collection 
and our registrations, however, have either been free or not cost prohibitive. Um, and the only thing that we've really come up to is just confusion with the permits that we've needed um, in terms of are organics considered solid waste or recyclable materials? There have been some times where we didn't think that we needed permits, but it turned out that we did. Um, but really, we've just navigated this through calling um, the different agencies in our areas or the county to find out what we actually need. And um, I think that's pretty much it. Anyone who's navigating this, I would just encourage you to call your town, city, county in your area and find out um, what you might need for hauling organics. And that's all. Thank you, Molly. That was excellent. Um, so I just wanted to thank all three of our panelists, David, Kristen, and Molly, for contributing your experiences about navigating the hauling permit process um, in order to provide local collection services. Uh, I wanted to offer this opportunity up um, for anybody who's listening today to submit some questions for our panelists. Uh, you can do that um, either by emailing Virginia Streeter at bstreeter at ilsaw.org directly or right here in the webinar control panel You'll see a tab that says questions. You can go ahead and type your questions in there and we can um, uh, start picking the brains of our panelists a little bit more. And I'm gonna start out with um, uh, the first question. Uh, this one is for David. Um, the question is, during the public hearing process with the Georgia EPD, were there stakeholders there that were actively advocating against the rule change for permits for small scale haulers? Um, and if so, if you could tell the audience a little bit more about that process. And I don't know if anyone needs to unmute David, or maybe David needs to unmute David. If Sorry, my connection was bad there for a second. What did, what was the question? Uh, David, the question is, during the public hearing process with the Georgia EPD, were there any stakeholders present at those meetings that were actively advocating against the rule change permit for small-scale haulers of compostable materials? Yes. Yeah, so there were some some stakeholders present that represented uh, some of the larger scale hauling models or companies um, in kind of the, the trash world. And I think their skepticism of it was uh, allowing these smaller scale companies to come in and uh, maybe do it in a way that was less professional in their eyes or that could be damaging in some way to their industry's perception. And a lot of, I think, that was uh, unfounded uh, and ultimately that that prevailed. The challenge is that Georgia is very much a good old boy type network. Uh, so it took a lot of um, building relationships and we actually went, you know, one of the best ways that I think you can build relationships is uh, being very honest and transparent in how you operate and bringing people to your site. And uh, that was, we held ourselves to above what we knew a standard for these types of facilities and, and these types of operations. So that by the time it came around to actual concern of whether we could execute on this or not, there, there was little to no uh, uh, reasoning for not going forward with it after actually seeing what we're doing. So yes, there was opposition, opposition, but building of the relationships and the transparency that was created ultimately prevailed. Great. Thank you. Um, I think a follow-up question is that um, opposition from other competitive bidders, uh, but there was there any also any opposition from city officials or uh, 
any of the public agencies who would have regulated the permit process? No, we, we didn't really see, receive any opposition. Um, the city officials very much understood what was trying to be accomplished uh, and felt confident, uh, again, that it wasn't a private entity bringing this to the table. We were involved, certainly, but there were, uh, you know, some some very sophisticated folks in, involved in the policy creation uh, that I think garnered a lot of trust and then that those were the folks that really pushed it through. Thanks, Mark. Uh, the next question, uh, somewhat related, um, this one is for Kristen, and uh, you had mentioned that some of your, uh, the policy changes were driven by um, the generators, uh, so could you explain a little bit more how food waste generators or even people who may use compostable serviceware um, that want to do the most sustainable thing with the material um, how they can get more involved in stakeholder processes for changing these permit rules, if that was an effective strategy? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, so you're asking how, like the world of Coca-Cola, for example, how, how they would get involved in the stakeholder meetings rather than just asking the hauler to do it? Exactly, yes. Yeah. Hmm. I guess, yeah, so that's a question that leads to more questions. Um, <laughs> those are the best. But so who, yeah, the question is who should be pushing for the change? Should it be, you know, the people who receive the compost, the people who make the compost, or the ones who have the product? Um, I was just in, I was just visiting my brother, and he, he was saying that, you know, the people who are producing the the waste product should be the ones that are responsible for the solutions, um, which is in, which is one interesting perspective. Um, and my my nine year olds just learned about the three different um, branches of government yesterday. So, you know, we were talking generally about how you know how checks and balances come into play and why they're important. And I think it is it's definitely good for those larger corporations to be at the stakeholder meetings, um, but it's all it's it's crucial that it's a that is a balanced group. Um, so, one of the meetings um, David discussed where there was, you know, the EPD was there, the EP, EPD. Um, there were teachers, there were farmers. Um, you know, there were three different compost haulers in the room. So it was just it was a really awesome table because it was super balanced, and you could get the perspective from everybody. So you know, if it's just the corporations that are pushing for how to manage their waste. You know, potentially they can just kind of curve it in, into their favor. Um, and if it's just the community composters that are there, you know, perhaps like w we might not understand the needs of those larger corporations. Um, so, I think it's important for you know, in social change, that the group is small enough. To so that all of them can discuss and have, you know, a pretty efficient impact, um, and just to make sure that the right types of people are at the table. And I know that the like the Georgia Re Recycling Coalition um, had a big part in that, and just in inviting certain people. And you know, maybe when the, we get these messages, we could send them to, you know, we could tell the U.S. Composting Council, hey, there's, you know, Coca-Cola is really interested in composting. Let's Let's reach out to them, see if they'll sponsor a conference. Let's get them in the conversation. Um, so that's one way to do it. Um, so just find out, you know, we've, we've also, as, as composters, we have this like, toolkit, right? Like we have certain people that we reach out to for certain things. Um, and it kind of benefits the whole industry if we find out like, hey, there's this massive uh, global corporation that really cares about compost. So let's get them on our team. And it might be talking to BioCycle, it might be talking to the US Composting Council, maybe it's talking to the EPA. Um, and maybe it's even bigger than that. So, it, you know, it's important to find out where the expertise is and who to ask and who to talk to and um, make sure we work together. Excellent advice. Thank you so much. Uh, this next question came in from Agneta Kreshner. Um, hope I pronounced that correctly. Apologies if I did not. Um, this is for any of the panelists today. Uh, the question is, 
Did any of you find that the more popular you got and the more your name spread around, you received more pushback about rules and laws? Um, this is Molly from Community Compost. We have not experienced that yet. Yeah, I think from our perspective, we haven't experienced that either. Uh, again, it's, I think the, I would think it's the opposite, just the longer uh, people get exposed to what you're doing, uh, the intent behind it, the quality of what you're doing, the uh, and learn more about it in general, I think leads to just more trust and less less pushback. I think people in the beginning are more, more skeptical of what you're doing, your intentions, why you're trying to do it, all that, uh, which puts up more barriers in the in the beginning. We didn't get any pushback on the rules, but we did get a lot of people that wanted composting to continue to be free. Um, so they almost pushed back against the legitimacy of it and didn't necessarily value the fact that we had this, you know, this business and this committed team and we were doing it on a regular schedule and we were making all these investments. It's like they almost wanted to, it to just be old school and free. So I think this, this is the first year that at least in Athens in like a fairly low income community, um, we're starting to get accepted as, as a business and, and people, you know, value our work and, and understand that it's not, it's not free. All right. Thanks guys. Uh, the next question, this comes from Kristen Lieber, and this is to all of the panelists as well. Uh, what are some of the consequences you've seen for asking forgiveness rather than permission? And <laughs> waiting to get fully permitted? Is it realistically better for a small composter to just get started and then wait until someone flags you? This is okay. This is closed webinar, so it's just community composters on the call. We do not have any regulators, just to make you feel all more comfortable. Right. Oh, and that, Courtney, that does bring up the fact that we did want people to feel open to say whatever on this webinar, but if there's something you say that you'd rather not be on a video, because we were thinking of making this video public afterwards so that other composters could watch it, just, just flag it and we'll remove it from the video. Um, but I was going to say, uh, with regard to this question, um, this is how laws get changed so often. There's usually somebody who is breaking a law and doing something really wonderful, and then they become an example that you could point to for why the law needs to get changed. I mean, this is like so embedded in the history of how laws get adapted, but it does mean you're kind of sticking your neck out there and it's risky. And of course, it, your lawyer cannot advise you to go and break the laws, but I also want to acknowledge just as part of our movement, this is, it's often going to be the case that you can't prove the viability of small scale composting until you start doing it. And then you need to carve out laws to make room for it later. Um, so that's just sort of like an uncomfortable reality in which a lot of co composters are likely going to be uh, living. But there are some of the consequences maybe that haven't been brought up yet of operating outside of the law is that it's much harder to get, say, loans from a bank if you're kind of an illegitimate business or it's hard if there's public funding available for what you're doing you might have to verify that you're operating in compliance with the law or you're not eligible for that funding um, and you know people won't invest in a business if it's a well I shouldn't say that I mean there's examples like Uber and Airbnb which were breaking laws in every city around the country but somehow getting all kinds of investment and growing like crazy until they went and changed the laws but it's just to acknowledge that it's a barrier to your growth if you're if you're operating in that way or it could be a barrier. I totally agree with that and um, that is just a barrier to growth and also like we don't want to be a secret industry you know we each one of us wants to compost as much as we possibly can and you know support ourselves support our families and hopefully hopefully support a big group of people and, and raise you know bring out new jobs so 
I don't really see the benefit in operating under the radar because that's not the goal. Eventually, we want to be public, we want to be normal, and we want to be funded. So, um, I mean, I don't. If there were a benefit to just operating under the radar for a while, um, that would be one thing. But I just don't. I just don't see any benefit. It's just there's huge public benefit to composting and to working with local municipalities. And a lot of times, it's just it's pretty, it's pretty like gentle conversation. You know, it, you just walk into their office and talk to them and you know, I don't know, at least I found that people have lots of time and they're pretty flexible. Yeah, I was just going to add that I think it's better to be proactive about figuring out what you need before you get started, or at least in the beginning, because if you find out that there's something that's required that could potentially shut down your business once you already got started, that could potentially be, you know, uh, more of a problem for you at that point. Yeah, I agree with all those points. Yeah, excellent advice. I think that operating in the gray area in the shadows um, is what's really kind of holding this in industry back. So thank you for um, just sending encouragement out there um, that this is part of the process and this is how we get laws changed. Um, next question is from Julia Mande, um, and this is for all of the panelists. Is there any guidance that you could offer for a subcontractor relationship or a micro hauling relationship um, with maybe a larger entity uh, for transporting material? This isn't guidance, but I will say I know of one composter that got a permit to do hauling, and then the city later found out that they were actually subcontract subcontracting out some of the hauling, and then their their per they were basically the city cracked down on them and said you can't be using subcontractors. You're the permit holder; only you can be doing this. And that was that was a real blow to that composter. Um, but I don't, I don't know if that it is always the case that the permit cannot apply to subcontractors. It might be something you can negotiate about when you're getting the permit. Yeah, we've done this in various capacities uh, over the years, and it can definitely be successful. Uh, it requires a lot of laying out, um, being very clear on on who's doing what and making sure that you're you're protected in uh, certain ways. Uh, I'm oftentimes in ad advocacy of uh, having as much opportunity to be the holder of the contract if possible uh, to to be able to dictate that relationship. If you're if you're a company that is saying that you're going to provide a service and this is what you're going to do and this is the the ethos behind it, it's most often easiest and most successful to do that if you have the direct opportunity to to have that con control but um yes it could be done collaboration is important um, but just has to be really spelled out all right uh, we've got a, just a few more questions here. So if you'd like to uh, add to the conversation and send us in a question, um, please do so in the tab of your GoToWebinar control panel under questions and we will ask it. Um, the next question comes from Vandra Thorburn. Um, and this is also again for all of the panelists. When jurisdictions Jurisdictions are looking to contract with just one company, so offering an exclusive permit permit to one contractor. Can you uh, give us some examples of what it's like to negotiate with those jurisdictions legislators, please? And I maybe just pipe up in here that the silence in this is that most of the three of our panelists today were not going up for exclusive contract bids in their areas. It seems that these were um, places where more than one operator can get a permit 
um, for any section of the municipal solid waste that's being produced. So there could be recycler contractors that work with just picking up recycled materials versus organic materials versus what is still considered protressable solid waste. Um, but if any of the panelists have anything to add to that comment, please let us know. Yeah, I guess our only experience with this is um, with the city of Hoboken and uh, we were the only hauler in the area. Um, so it wasn't an issue. And I can speak just a little bit um, from our experience and process in Oakland is that there is a section of the exclusive contract um, that's signed that allows for um, modifications to be made to the contract. Um, and this would include if a new collector of material was providing an other service outside of the scope of what the contract covered. And the process then with legislators would be that they would go back to the contractor and offer them a period of 120 days to provide a proposal uh, for uh, um, expanding their business to provide those other services. Or they can reject to provide service for other services. And then the jurisdiction would be allowed to offer a permit to the other person or the other service provider that does want to offer those other services. Now, the caveat here is that those other services have to match um, strategies, agenda, and priorities of a general plan for that jurisdiction. In the case of Oakland, it's a zero waste implementation plan. Um, so uh, the person who is the existing contract or permit holder would have to agree that they didn't want to do that new service that is being requested. Um, uh, so it's really that the legislators work with the um, city administrators and the city attorneys to renegotiate uh, an existing contract. Um, or the bid process, if, it, if we're starting from the beginning, the bid process at the onset is either to grant an exclusive contract to one person or it is a competitive bid process. So it's set up, the negotiations are set up um, right from the outset. But if anyone else has anything to add, that would be lovely. This is Janelle. I think a good message we should all be sending to cities everywhere is just please do not create a monoculture system for waste removal and organic waste because I think that's going to be the easy solution if cities are feeling pressure to create an integrated or a, a citywide system. Mm -hmm then a lot of them are gonna find it easy to just contract with a giant corporation that'll cover the entire city. And there's just a huge missed opportunity there for creating a local micro enterprise, for creating different and rich and more diverse types of compost. Um, so I, think, I know some cities like LA have kind of sliced up the city into different zones and, and engage contractor, different contractors for different zones. And so that's one way to kind of, to break it up and make sure there's not just a monoculture system for the entire city. Um, but to really just encourage cities that the more diverse approaches may not be 100% the most easy or efficient, but there's so many other benefits to the city uh, in in doing that. All right, next question also comes from Vandra. Uh, and I think this one is directed at Janelle. Uh, the question is, how did you come to 20 cubic yards for the definition of micro composting sites? Um, nothing scientific here, but in California, uh, there is already an exemption for sites. This is a site permitting exemption for sites that are 100 cubic yards or less. And if you think about it, in an urban environment, anywhere that you have 100 cubic yards of compost, that's actually a fairly large facility. And if we're trying to create exemptions for if we're if we're asking regulators to more or less disregard composting that's happening on a very small scale, we thought we needed something smaller. 
Um, and so 20 cubic yards, I can't remember. There, somebody said it is roughly the size of a shipping container, if I'm recalling right. Um, so that might be how we came to it. Yeah, but it's very arbitrary. So I welcome feedback on, on these numbers. Thanks, Janelle. Um, the next question is also from Vandra. And this is, uh, uh, I think, directed at Molly. Um, New York City is currently considering commercial waste zones. A cohort of micro haulers is in conversation with the Department of Sanitation and other lawmakers. Uh, she would love to review some of the initial documents with Janelle um, for your thoughts. Uh, so I guess this is directed at Janelle for an opportunity for, uh, for collaboration. That's exciting. Well, I think it would be great to share it with everyone, maybe like on the community compost listserv and um, yeah, just to get broad feedback on, on how those are taking shape, because that could be a really good model for other cities, if that's how New York City is approaching it. All right, and uh, do we then just offer up a quick opportunity for any additional questions that our participants may have? And then I'll just ask one final question. I know that um, cost comes up a lot for small scale operators in any industry, um, but it seems after the panel presentations today that most of you dealt with very low costs, like around $150 to totally zero costs. Um, but we do see a lot in these uh, bids and for uh, contractors that um, that a service provider might not only have to have a business license to get a permit, but they might also have to offer up uh, a bond. Um, so I just wanted to have Janelle, if, if she could, just clarify what a bond is and what it's based on. If it's your annual revenues, if it's your insurance policies, if it's your liability coverage or other factors. Because sometimes the permit process itself may be free, but what's required to get the permit may cost you a lot of money. For example, getting the business license, getting um, an, uh, your fleet to be the type of vehicles required for that permit, so more expensive over, say, bicycles, um, and then what you might have to put up to the city for liability insurance in order to operate. So if we clarify what a bond does, first from Janelle, but also then maybe from the panelists, if you could consider these other things that were required of you to get a free permit, if we could put maybe some of those costs, um, just to give our listeners an idea what chunk of change they could um, see as average. Thanks. Um, on the question of what is a bond, it's a little bit like an insurance policy. It's something that you pay for and then a company basically says, we're going to make X amount of money available to you to cover certain costs if you have them. And I, I don't really know how many cities are requiring bonds, but I think, for example, if you're a city that is entering into a contract with a hauler, you want to make sure that that hauler is going to do their job and do it well and not cause problems for the city. And if they do cause problems for the city, you'll probably find them. And that's when a city wants to make sure that the compost hauler has money available to pay that fine. And so that's where a bond might come in. Uh, Courtney, you might know actually better than I, like how many cities are requiring this? I think maybe the city of Alameda um, sometimes requires bonds of haulers, but other times not. But it's it's basically something you you pay a small amount for, and then it makes an amount of money available to you to more or less, I guess, borrow um, if you need it. Thanks, Janelle. And then just for our panelists, did was a bond part of your process? And then if not, if we could get maybe a better idea of what the average amount of costs to operate at the scale you wanted to, even if the permit itself was free, just to meet the obligations of going through that permit process. I'm sorry, that broke up. Could you say that again, please? 
Yeah, um, so what we heard from the panelists today was that a lot of the permit process itself may be very low cost, like actually paying for the permit from, I heard from $150 down to $0, but that the um, specific requirements of the permit process do require you to have capital uh, costs up front that you've invested into your business in order to qualify for the permit. So these may be the cost of a business license, for example, or the cost of garnering a fleet of vehicles that meet the requirements to collect in that jurisdiction. So a, a vehicle over, say, a bicycle. Um, and if we consider those as also costs, not just paying for the permit itself, if you guys could give us a better idea of what sort of um, uh, budget that we would have to plan for on average. Uh, I think that that number would be all over the place. It would be hard to just pull a, a average of that, uh, but I think rather I, I can comment on just all the things that do have costs to them that need to be considered in the process. Like you're saying, are, are the business license, the just that, the fleet of vehicles themselves, the um, costs on those vehicles. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's pretty much everything that goes into to getting a business started uh, to have the baseline level opportunity to uh, obtain a permit. And then on the side of the facility side of things, uh, there then becomes things that require more time uh, in the permitting process, such as the design standards for the property, uh, which again are in any permit, there will be certain restrictions and standards that you have to meet, which will uh, dictate how much of an investment that that takes. Some of some of this and hopefully going forward will require less investment, which uh, means there are less barriers for other uh, groups to come in and do this work, which is is really important. So, uh, I think that is definitely something that we need to be aware of and look at for creating the opportunity for more people to work participate in this work with lower barriers barriers of entry. Yeah, I think um, for us it would also be hard to come up with an exact number, but. Um, for the one permit that we're required to have in Ulster County, um, it's about $250 for all of our vehicles because it's $150 plus $30 per additional vehicle. Um, and, you know, other costs would be insurance, registration for the business. Um, we have all commercial vehicles, so getting those vehicles registered. And then also um, you have to have them labeled with your business name. And if you have uh, permit numbers or DOT numbers that are required to be on that as well. Excellent. Well, I just wanted to uh, take this last couple of minutes, if we didn't have any other questions, um, to thank our panelists, David, Kristen, and Molly, for spending time with us today and talking about your experience navigating the permit process to provide local collection services for compostable materials. Um, and to Virginia Streeter uh, and the Institute for Local Self-Reliance for partnering with us to host this webinar today and also to Janelle Orsi um, for providing a little bit of legal context uh, to this issue. Um, and then also just to uh, remind you all that the Sustainable Economies Law Center does have a program on compost policy and we do welcome um, you to get in contact with us. Um, if you have any questions or need any additional legal interpretations or legal help um, through this process, um, I can be reached at kbrown at commoncompost.org and Janelle can be reached at janelle at the selk, S -E -L -C .org. Um, But we're just about ready for uh, just the time is just about up. Um, so I just wanted to thank everybody for taking the time to 
to learn about this issue a little bit more from us today and we'll be staying in contact. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank Yay. you. Everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.